the Spirit. Let's go to the book of Acts, the fourth chapter this morning. The book of Acts, the fourth chapter. Now, I'm going to, uh, you know, as somebody mentioned to me, you know, so I've been praying and praying for a while for deliverance. And, you know, and, and this individual has seen a lot of miracles in their lives. They've, they've, they've experienced healings. They've experienced deliverances. They've been set free from a lot of bondages in their life, a dramatic life of sin, and then all of a sudden God revolutionized their life. But they were, they're struggling over a matter in their life that um, is, uh, you know, they, they've, been, they've seen other healings in their life. They've seen other deliverances in their life. But all of a sudden now, I'm not getting nowhere with this pastor. What's going on? And I, I said to him, and I'll say to you as well, I say this to you because sometimes when we, we get um, kind of lazy in our chase for God and our, our commitment to God and our heart of intimacy with him, and we just kind of take him for granted. Have you ever took anybody for granted? Have you ever took your wife or your husband for granted? And those that are on the recipient end, how much do you like it? If you're on the recipient end of being taken for granted, you kind of almost, well, really? Wow. You know, that's, that, I'm just here. I'm just, uh, you know. And, and it's not that God, God never feels bad at you. But, the, but God, what he does, he allows you to stay right there until you come to the realization that's what we were singing today. We need more of him. And I challenged that brother. I said, some things only come by prayer and fasting. Okay. Some things are going to come to you by prayer and fasting. What's that mean? That I need to pray for the power to rise up above this? No, what you need to pray for is that your heart would die out. That your flesh would die out. That your self-personality and your self-strength would die out. And that you would literally become weak in his presence so then he can show him strong, self strong through you. Because it's not you that's doing the miracle. The only thing you're learning to do is learning to rest and trust him. And, and prayer and fasting, for me, that does that for me. It gives me the ability to say no to the flesh. It gives me the strength to say no to the flesh. It tells the flesh that, look, I don't have to have bread to live today. I can live by the word of God today. And I can take in the substance of God's power and anointing. And my body will go on. And, and, and this sickness will not reside in my body, but because of the power of God in me. And it's, the, it's killing the, the thinking of the... I guess the stinking thinking in you and it's bringing to life the reality of what God wants to do. And, and that's where we need to rest out of the heart. You know, we, we say things we're believing, but are we really believing? <laughs> are you really believing? Because if you're really believing, it must give way. It must respond to the word. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So everything that is named in heaven and earth has to bow to the power of God. Amen. The power to the name of Jesus. But the problem is, do we understand and believe it? Do we really see it there? Do we operate and live in that supernatural place of walking in the spirit? The book of Acts, we're going to talk about beyond belief and some things that cannot be denied. I want to look at some things that cannot be denied in your life and must not be denied. If they're not denied, I guarantee then you'll rise up above your circumstance. The first thought that I want to give you this morning is that of the master himself. God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit cannot be denied in your life. You cannot allow yourself to deny your need for him. Allow him to be uh, kind of second to you. And, 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 and you can't allow yourself to constantly give him uh, second best or, or even third best or fourth best. He always must be first. He must be your first thought. When, when your house caught on fire, Josh, and you first got that call, the first thought it should have been, and I trust was, and it probably is, because that's why you were able to say what you said in that parking lot that day, is God is in this. God is going to work in my life. And he's, it, I didn't look to myself. I didn't look to the fire department. Thank God for the fire department. Thank God they were there. And thank God for all the help they brought to my family and my life. But I'm telling you, I look to God first. God, I don't see and I don't understand what this is all about. But God, I'm still looking to you. I'm looking to you first. God, you're going to bring resolve to this circumstance. And to God be the glory. God's going to get glory out of this circumstance. Amen. But it must be first. It must not be, uh, you know, I'm not saying don't, uh, don't call the fire department. Call the fire department. I'm not saying don't call the police. Don't call the ambulance when you need them. Don't call the doctor when you need them. But I'm telling you. The, the first thought is that God help us to get to where the first one I call on is the name Jesus. The name Jesus. I've seen it work even when I wasn't expecting it. 
and, and I've used examples before, but I remember at the very cry of the name Jesus, when I was under pressure, and I wasn't saying him in a curse word, I was calling out to him, Lord Jesus, if you don't do something, right now I'm in a huge mess, and I've watched how my circumstance, in that moment of just speaking his name, everything came into order. It was, it, it was supernatural. It was really crazy. It was beyond belief. That's what we're preaching about today. It was literally beyond belief. In the natural, the natural man can't understand it, but the spirit, and I know, I know that I know that I know, nobody ever, you can, you can put me to death over, I can tell you right now, I know that God intervened that moment I spoke his name. I know he did, because my cry wasn't to all the natural abilities that I might have or somebody else has, my cry was the one that can do it all, his name is Jesus. And my heart at that moment was really crying out. And, and because of it, at that moment, everything in that moment came to order in accordance to what Jesus needed for my life. And, and I can share countless times when that has happened to me. And even when you don't really think about it, you don't, you don't have time to look up scriptures and meditate on them. You better speak it right now. What's going to be the cry of your heart? What's really in your heart? Do you have the power and authority to deal with your circumstances? Because you're going to have times when you're caught unaware. When you don't know, God knew, it, it, you don't think God knew what was going to happen to the house? You don't think God knew that Mr. Mike was going to slip into eternity? You don't think that God knew all these different things that would occur in your life? He knows it before you even know it, by far. But because he knows it, that's where our hope should be, in him and not in our natural ability. Let's look at the scripture this morning. Let's go to Acts, uh, uh, the fourth chapter, verse 13. Acts, the fourth chapter, verse 13. We want to start reading there. And now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. Man, if you would please underscore that you have been with Jesus. Get this in your spirit. I need to be with Jesus. I need to be with Jesus. Come on, get it in your spirit today. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. <laughs> I love that. I, I don't know if that, if that rattles you thinking like it does mine, but I love, that, I love that the devil can't say a word against you. Don't you love it? The devil can't. He ain't got no authority here, man. Whether you like it or not, he doesn't have any authority in your circumstance. And he can gawk at it, and he can whine and throw a fit all he wants, but he has nothing to say against it. Amen? But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves. So obviously... Peter and John were before the council of the Sanhedrin that day. And in verse 13, and after they began to hear what they had spoken and see what they had done, they put them out of the council. Okay, we've, we've heard your peace, and we see this guy. Now get out of our faces right now. We've got we to gotta convert one another. And here's what they say in saying, What shall we do with these men? For indeed they have done a notable miracle, and it has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. So what, what are we supposed to do with this? These guys came in and healed this guy. Now what are we supposed to do with this? We, we're trying to snuff out this Jesus. We're trying to do away with this gospel. We're trying to do away with this message. We're trying to do away with this one and, 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 that they call master. And, and here we are. What, what do we do with this? They've done something we can't argue with, debate. It's, it's in our face. <laughs> So, you know, it's kind of when you wake up in the morning, I'm in your face, devil. Amen. Praise the Lord. But so, but so that it spread no further among the people, let us uh, severely threaten them that from now on they speak to no man in this name. And they called to them, commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, <laughs> Whether it be right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot speak the things, uh, I'm sorry, but, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way of punishment for them because the people, I'm, I'm sorry, because of the people's sense, they all glorified God for what had, had been done. For the man 
was over 40 years old on whom the miracle of healing had been performed. This first thought that I want to say under the thought of master, uh, the master cannot be denied is that of God's presence. We desperately need to know that God's presence is with us even when we don't feel it. We must get in our spirits. We must totally be convinced within our souls, within our spirit, within our, even our flesh, that no matter when I can't feel them in the flesh, when I don't have the goosebumps, when I don't have that warm, fuzzy feeling, when I don't know that, uh, you know, because of my natural senses that there's some tangible evidence that God is with me, you must know that his presence is with you. It cannot always be that of feeling. Thank God. How many like to feel the goosebumps? How many like to feel the presence of God? But how many know that you don't have to have the feeling to know that he's there? Amen. That's when we ought to praise him all the more. That's when we ought to magnify the name of Jesus all the more is when we don't quote unquote feel his presence. Okay. I love what Peter and John spoke uh, in, in the scripture here. It says they spoke with boldness. The word boldness is referred to as an unreserved uh, speech. It, it, it is referenced as unreserved. When you look up that word in the Greek, it's translated unreserved speech. Okay. And, and it is the idea that someone speaks their mind without regards of what others think about them. Now hear my heart. They speak their mind. It's not just because they can be rude or arrogant. It's not about being rude and arrogant. It's about being right and confident. It's about being what's right and confident. And you can do it in a way that is so powerful that it cannot be denied. It cannot be denied. And, and Peter and John weren't there to be rude or arrogant. They were there, there to simply be fully confident and bold in what they knew was right. Silver and gold I don't have, but I do have something. See, there was a confidence in the man knowing that I have something to give you today. And it's not going to be because silver and gold, of all the silver and gold I have, it wouldn't fix your problem. So, and, and, and all of what modern medicine offers at times, it won't fix your problem. It, it must be that I look to God. And, and is that kind of boldness in you? How does that boldness come to you? By once a week being in church? By once a week opening your Bible? By once a week presenting yourself? In fact, I do it more than once a week, Pastor. I pray th at least three times a day. I pray over lunch, dinner, and breakfast, okay? You know, is it, is it just then that we're, con uh, you know, con confining with God and communing with God? Or is there really communion with Him? Is there really a time spent with Him? Is there a time in His presence daily? Do you sense and know his presence even, again, when you don't feel him? Do you just know that you know that you know that he's there? Because you've taken time to address him. You've taken time to present yourself afresh and new. Because that's where that boldness came from. There was a confidence of Peter when he left that upper room that I know that something dramatic is happening in me. I saw what my, my Jesus, my Lord and Savior did. And, I, and, and when he returned back and then for those 40 days he's been pouring into us about the kingdom of God, about the will of God for my life and, and the lives of my brothers and sisters, I know what he's endued me to do. Because there was a time when he empowered me for a short season. He said to me and the, my other disciple to go out. He said, I'm going to give you power to cast out devils. I'm going to give you power to heal the sick and I'm going to give you power to preach repentance. And when they did that, the Bible says they came back. We talked about that last week. They came back and they were communing with God and that's where they fed the 5,000, okay? Jesus said, no, you feed them. He was trying to help them understand, you're already equipped to do this, but you don't think so. You don't know so, you don't understand. But now Peter's crossed over to a place that now I know so. I know that I know that I know, man. I've been in the upper room. The power of God spoke through me, flowed out of me like rivers of living water. The cloven tongues of fire descended. And there's an anointing in me. I know that I know that I know. Whether I feel it or not today, it doesn't matter. I know that it's there. So get up in the name of Jesus and walk. And the man got up and walked. It was a miracle they could not deny. This, again, comes from us taking time with the Father. The more time you spend with the more you'll be like him. Amen. Have you ever seen some of the cutest times as I love watching some of y'all on Facebook and I see you with your kids. And a friend of mine um, from South Georgia uh, has been in his older years of life had a child. Him and his wife had a child in the late 40s. 
And uh, a beautiful little girl, um, Brother John's walking with his daughter. And John is walking, and all of a sudden you see the little daughter trying to simulate dad. So his steps are just kind of normal, but her steps are like this. And she's trying to stay right in the footsteps of her daddy. And I thought, man, what a picture of what we should be like with God. What a picture what we should be like with God. I just want to step where you step, God. I want to feel what you feel. I want to be just like you, Daddy. I just want to be that way. When you're that way, again, I'm reminded so many times of that story again that Joey Hip shared with me. That when his daughter climbed up on his lap, was kind of almost irritated him. Said, "Honey, what do you want?" He was a little bit tired from the road and everything. She said, "I just want to be with you, Daddy." He said, "At that moment, she said that, okay, honey, get the checkbook. Yeah, baby, you can have anything you want. You can have the house. You can have the cars. You can have everything. Why? Because she won the heart of the Father. And if we win the heart of the Father, all hell better look out. Amen." All hell that's raging against you and trials and tribulations that are coming your way. You'll have all the power to walk right through them and not be burned. Amen. I didn't write this book. God did. A, a power that cannot be denied. That's the second one there. His power is undeniable. It wasn't the power of Peter and John that raised that boy up. For 40 years, that man, think about it. For 40 years, this man was sitting. And, and instead of getting or growing in hope... I, I feel like he was growing in more despair because, you know, the older you get, the muscles kind of sink down in the natural. <laughs> I, I used to have muscles, man. I look in the mirror today and they're, where'd they go? Where'd they go? I, I get downstairs and try to work out and build them back up and it's taken forever to get some little bump here. I used to have a pretty good bump there. Now it's taken forever to get a bump back. Why? It's called a muscle because it's deteriorated because of age in the natural, Okay. There is some natural things that occur. But in the spirit, we should never be feeble. We should never be feeble. God help us to never be feeble. The power is always there. It's more than enough. I love this. The Bible says that they were unlearned and ignorant men. The word unlearned is literally meaning that they were illiterate. They were commoners, unskilled men. Uh, one writer said, ignorant and I dots. I don't, <laughs> I don't know if I want to call you an I dot, but the, in, in this writing, they said that it literally was translated idiot, a dummy. You know, in all accounts of what the theologians would have spoke, they weren't trained in any homiletic, uh, hom homiletics and they didn't have hermeneutics uh, for their classes. Nobody trained them how to preach or teach. Nobody gave them uh, lessons in English or, or in their language of Hebrew and Greek. They didn't have any formal training of anything. And you would have thought, man, who wants to listen to them? What do they got to say? And Paul himself, now a guy that was trained in the language, he himself would say in, in comparison to the Spirit of God in him, he said that uh, I didn't come with the persuasive words. He said, I don't, he said, my words are inadequate. But he said, one thing that's not inadequate is the Spirit of God in me. And he said, I came with the demonstration of the power of the Holy Ghost. And he began to lay hands on the sick and watch them recover. He began to cast out devils, and he began to literally at times raise the dead. Paul raised the dead on numbers of accounts. Okay, why did he do that? How did he do that? He did that because he was into the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, living in the Holy Spirit, living in the supernatural, walking in the supernatural. Where did these men learn to trust like this? Where did these men learn to trust like this? I'm going to just throw some questions at you. Where did these men learn to the trust like this, where did they learn this truth that they were sharing? Where did they learn this truth that they were sharing? Think about it. Where did they gain the boldness with which they would preach this gospel? Where did that boldness come from? Where does that boldness come from? What happened to these men to make them into what they are now? Come on, Peter at the fireside of the cross was at, 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 or at the, at the uh, council of, uh, where they were judging Jesus that night at the fireside when the maiden, handmaiden came and said, I know you, you're one of those disciples. And the Bible says he cursed the name of Jesus and ran from the fire. Why? Because I was not one of, I, did, I don't know that man that's on trial. This is the same Peter that's saying, silver and gold have I none, but such as I had, get up in the name of Jesus and walk. 
And over and over you see Peter do wonderful things. What made that boldness? Again, it is the power of God. It is being and living and walking in the Spirit. It's more than, and let me say this, it's more than just the gift of tongues. There's, there's eight other gifts. It's more than just one gift of the Spirit. It's all the gifts of the Spirit. Released through the power of God in us to do what God wants us to do. I need you as a church. We need one another to be operating in the gifts of the Spirit. There's going to be times when I might operate in one gift and you might operate in another, but that's the power of the, the, of the, of the uh, church, the fellowship of the church, is that we become strong as we come together. One of the biggest battles we have in churches today is brothers and sisters loving one another. <laughs> We're on the same team, y'all. We're brothers in the Lord. We're sisters in the Lord. We are on the same team. I am your brother. You are my brother. Yeah, there's moments when we'll have disagreements. But man, you're a brother in the Lord. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. We're of the same family. Let me just say this to you. With attitudes like that, I wonder, are you going to make heaven your home? And if you make heaven your home, what's God going to do? He's going to stick you in the corner together. <laughs> I remember that's one of the worst punishments. We used to think spanking was good for our kids. But when I found out that I found something better than spanking, when my girls were fighting with one another, we'd make them sit on the couch and put their arms in love around one another. They couldn't pinch one another. They couldn't. You better sit there with your arm and gently love your sister. Just sit there. Smile. Don't be growling at each other. Don't be pinching each other. You sit there in love until finally they, they would sit there and begin to laugh and love one another. It's amazing what would happen. But boy, you know... I'm going to pinch you in my butt. You know, don't. I'm going to pinch you my... You know what? You sit there long enough with your arm around your brother, you begin to laugh again. You begin to love again. God, help us to live there. Come on. That was a commercial break for you. You needed it. I need you to know it. Amen. Amen. I need... I, Spiritual fire extinguishers, I need a lot of them. No, I'm just teasing. I'm not the only pastor. I was in a pastor's meeting the other day. <laughs> I was there yesterday with, or, or Friday night with, and, and, and I started laughing because I realized our church is so much more better than so many others. <laughs> I started hearing some of those other pastors. I'm thinking, thank you, Jesus. That's not faith family. Thank you, Jesus. That's not faith family. Thank you, Jesus. That's not faith family. Um, you know, we have our own problems, our own circumstances. But I love you, and I believe you love me. If you don't, you can't make heaven your home, so nanny, nanny, nanny. You got to love me. You got to love me. Yeah, I got to quit. Let's get back to the message. The second one this morning is miracles cannot be denied. This guy was in their face. It don't matter what the council conceived against Peter and John. We got a problem. They did something out of the ordinary. They got into something called the supernatural. They got into something called the Spirit of God. They got into something called the name Jesus. It must be a cult because look at what they're doing. They even declared that they were healing in the name of Beelzebub. You know, come on. Come on. A kingdom divided against itself, a church divided against itself will not stand. But a church, when they come together, when the Spirit of God and you I come together with God, all things become possible. All things become possible. And I look at this, a miracle cannot be denied. In verse 3, or chapter 3, verse 2, go with me to the book of Acts, just kind of follow me. Acts, the third chapter, verse 2, tells us that this man had been born lame like this. So it tells me that this man's body kept growing weaker. His hope began to get deferred to the point where he's just satisfied with the fact that, you know, if they get me to the gate beautiful, I'll get some money today and I'll be able to eat for today. He did that. And, and physically and emotionally, I'm, I'm sure that guy was at a point where he just didn't care anymore. And I'm sure he was there fully expecting, just give me some money, please. I got to go. Somebody's going to have to drag me to the store so I can go get some bread so I can eat for today. His body, he was looking at his body over 40 years old now. 
his limbs had shrunk down to just bone skeleton. Have you ever seen anybody where they lose the mobility of their body because of a spinal injury or something? And though their legs are there, their legs just shrivel because there's no movement in them anymore. There's no muscle movement. There's no, and their legs literally contract down to hardly nothing because why? They've been like that for years. Now all of a sudden, this guy that has no muscle, in a moment, instantaneous moment, his muscles expanded, his legs popped out, his joints all come together, and he stood up, and he didn't just stand up and walk. The Bible says he was running and leaping and dancing in their faces. And the whole time he was doing it, he was giving praise to Jesus. I'm giving praise to Jesus. This is the God we serve. This is the God that resides in you. This is the one by his spirit that wants to manifest through you the same way he manifested through Peter and John that day. He's not changed. That same anointing, we often think we got to get into the anointing or we often got to ask the anointing to come. Look at the anointing's already in you. Stir it up in the name of Jesus. The anointing's already in you, Timothy. Stir up the gift of God that's within you. Know that the faith that you have is more than enough to move mountains if by faith you stir yourself up. Believe it. Believe it and then therefore receive it. An undeniable walk of healing. An undeniable walk of healing. If you're keeping notes, in vo- uh, chapter 4, verse 22, tell us, or tells us that this man was over 40 years old. Uh, verses, uh, and in chapter 3, verses 8 through 11, tells us that uh, this formerly lame man was now leaping, walking, and running, and praising God in their faces. I'm telling you, it's such a powerful thing. Write this scripture down. 2 Corinthians, the 5th chapter, verse 17. 2 Corinthians, the 5th chapter, verse 17. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. Colossians 1, 13 through 14. And then also Colossians uh, 2, 13 through 15. And then Galatians 5, 19 through 25. I'm going to give you a little bit of homework. Go home and read those scriptures. It's all about what we're speaking about here today. An undeniable walk of healing and deliverance. Uh, it says in, in, in 2 Corinthians, the 5th chapter, verse 17. It says, we are a new creation. You have been changed and have been made into a miracle of transformation that cannot be denied. I'm a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are now new. That is a miracle. You don't believe it? Just hang around Dale Dale Morris. (laughs) To know what he was one time and know what he is now. Here's testimony. Here's David's testimony. Get around these guys. I love being around them. You know why? Because I see dramatic changes. They're the Apostle Paul in modern day language. They've been kicked off their horse. They were blinded for a moment, and now they see. And, and it's exciting to be around people that have had transformation. And every one of us here today, I, I think of others in this room here, and I, I don't, I don't want to call you out with us. I embarrass you. I, I know these two guys, I can pick on them a little bit, and they don't get too embarrassed with me. But the bottom line is, folks, there's transformation in all of us. I thank God for what God's done in me. It's a transformation of healing. It's a transformation of thanksgiving, of worship. This guy went from a guy that had no worship to a guy that has more worship than he can contain. It's now blown out of him. He just can't help himself. Could you imagine what it would be like? Come on. Could you imagine what it would be like for 40 years of your life in a bondage? That you're always dependent on somebody. If somebody don't come and get you today, you're not going to have substance. If somebody don't wait on you today, if somebody don't feed you with a spoon, if somebody don't provide for you today, could you imagine for 40 years of your life being in that kind of bondage? I know this is symbolic of what happened in the life of Israel because of their sins. 40 years in the wilderness, 40 years this man is symbolically saying the bondage days are over. The days of the wilderness experience are over. You're set free to walk. And the liberty that came to that guy's heart was one that set his feet to dancing, his mouth to shouting. Hallelujah. And it should set our feet to dancing and shouting every day of our lives. And even when we're out on the streets and somebody is in despair, we should have an answer for them. It's Jesus. Amen. And get that Holy Ghost boldness. Just be with them. Just go speak to them. You don't have to be rude and arrogant. You can be firm and confident. You know what? I know that this is happening in your life, but I also know that I serve a God that can fix this for you. Will you let me pray? 
But when you pray, be confident. Be confident in that same boldness that Peter did. Silver and gold I don't have, but I'd give you something right now in the name of Jesus and expect. Expect. You're saying, I can't do that, Pastor. I can't do that. It's because it's not in your heart to do it. If it gets in your heart to do it, you'll do it. And that's not to scold you. It's to challenge you. If you struggle to do that, it's because it's not in your heart to do it. Because you're letting fear dominate you instead of faith. I don't know what else to say to us, but I have to say it to myself all the time. Because there's times when I get in fear. If I do that, you know, that ain't going to happen. I've thought those thoughts too. But I need to bring all those thoughts captive to the obedience of God's word. And I need to deny those thoughts and reject those thoughts. And there's times when we can't reject them because we've not been with the master. And the only way you're going to be able to reject them is put the flesh to death by prayer and fasting. You got mountains in your path. It's, aren't you tired of it? If you got mountains in your path, it's time for you to do what? Pray and fast and seek his face. Seek him until you find. Knock until the door is open. Otherwise, you can sit there and just see what the doctors can do for you. See what the lawyer can do for you. See what the banker can do for you. See what this world can offer you in the natural senses. But it's always going to be lacking. It's, never, it's always going to be where you're going to need more. But if we start pressing ourselves, reject everything else but the word, and pressing ourselves into the word, that's what I'm preaching this message for. This is what Faith Family Church is all about. That's why God brought us together. That's why you're still here. I know there's been a lot of you that, man, I just, I'm tired of it, I'm leaving, I'm going, doing, that's fine. It's not fine, but it is fine. You know what? I, I, and and I'm, not, I'm not asking you to leave. Please, I'm begging you don't. What I'm asking you to do is help me and help one another. Let's provoke one another to get into that place where miracles should happen continuously. Our kids shouldn't be bound by sickness. Our wives shouldn't be bound by sickness. Our husbands shouldn't be bound by sickness. Our lives shouldn't be racked by all these pains and, and anxieties that we're dealing with. We should be rising above that because the blood of Jesus Christ is sufficient for it. And to say anything less than that is to be a slap in his face to say, God, that your blood isn't sufficient, so i got to go someplace else to find my resolve. You and I both know that's not true. But why do we do it? So all I can say to you is I keep provoking you to understand this is where we got to go. It's the only way out. It's the only source. You know what? God's not going to give you any more miracles because you've got lazy and apathetic and you've hardened your heart. When you were young in the Lord, you used to get miracle after miracle right away. Bang, bang, bang. Man, it was like walking on water every day with Jesus. Now all of a sudden, things slowed back and you got complacent. Now all of a sudden, you find yourself in a religion. The assemblies of God, I'm of the assemblies of God. That's religion. It's not relationship. I'm of the church of Jesus Christ. I'm of God the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. I have a relationship with him. He is my God and my Lord and my Savior. In him will I trust. In him will I serve and live and have my being. I'll speak what he speaks. I'll do what he does. I'll have what he has. Amen. Amen. I'll have what he has. I know that's a strong, hard word, but it's the right word. It is the right word. I don't want my kids to be without. So I, as a dad, better get into Jesus. I don't want my wife to be without. I challenge my sons-in-laws every day. Guys, are you making sure my daughters are going to make heaven their home? And then I'll challenge my daughters. Daughters, are you speaking encouragement to your husband and building them up in faith? Are you doing that? Why? Because it's the only way that's right. I don't care what the world says. It's what God's word says that's most important to us. Get it in your spirit. A message that cannot be denied, the last one. He had a worship of, of praise and thanksgiving. Now, number three, the message that cannot be denied. It's a message of love. It's a message of life. It's a message of liberty. <laughs> it's a message of love that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever. It's for anybody. 
We've been predestined. Mankind has been predestined to be saved. I would that all men come to the saving knowledge of what I predestined for them. But if they don't, that's their choice. I would to God that all of them be healed and whole and well. But if they don't, it's their choice. I would to God that all these miracles would transform through their lives, but if it don't, that's what he predestined us for. If you want to know what predestination is, that's exactly what Jesus did, he expected to happen through all our lives. A message of love, a message of life. Man, I have everlasting life already. I'm not just waiting to get to heaven. The devil can't kill me. Yeah, he can kill my body, but he can't kill my soul. He can't kill my spirit. They're gods. I'm training every day my soul to come more like my spirit. So at that last day, I know that I'll be redeemed both spirit, soul, and body. <laughs> the body has to give way to the spirit because it's the eternal part of me. And the soul must be trained to give way to the spirit because it's the right thing to do. My mind is God's mind. And then you talk about liberty. <laughs> Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Are you free this morning? It don't, it, it, Josh and Chelsea, are you guys free this morning? Amen. Amen. You're free. Don't matter what the devil tries to steal from you. He's going to have to pay it back seven times. By faith, that's what the word says. Stay right there, son. If you are my son and you are my son by faith, stay right there, Josh. It doesn't matter how it feels or what it looks like. And it could be get a little harder for a while. I'm telling you, stay right there, boy. Because if you do, the devil's got to give it back. The devil's got to be. And when you can't, trust that pastor's going to be there for you. Trust that your dad's going to be for you. Trust that David's going to be there for you. Trust that Judy's going to be there for you. Trust that Brother Bill's going to be there for you. We're going to be there for you. And when Brother Bill's in trouble, when Judy's in trouble, we're going to be there for them. That's what it is as a family. Grow in faith. Grow in family. That in turn we grow his church. It's our vision. I need you to come up here with me. You need me to go up there with him. So keep pushing me. Keep pushing me. Pastor, I know you can do it. I know, you, I know you're there. By faith, you're going there and I'm coming there with you. I'm coming there with you. If you don't think I'm already there, then just believe I'm there. Okay? Keep pushing me. I'm believing that there's going to be a day when every day I'll see signs and wonders performed through my hands and your hands. I believe by faith we're already there. Okay? Though we don't see it, at times we're still there. I don't want to wait. I don't want to wait to see Kinley in heaven walking and leaping. I want to see little Kinsley walking and leaping here. I don't want to see David's boy. God, I, I got to wait to heaven to see his miracle? Uh-uh, I want to see that boy well here in this life. I don't want to see some of you crippled and dealing with our anxieties here, and then when I get to heaven, I get to rejoice with you. I want to rejoice now because God said I can have it now. He's a now God. Get your mind around that. I'm going to keep pushing us, and pushing us not to irritate you, but if it irritates you, then you better look within. You better look within because God's calling you out. God's calling this church out. Too many prophetic words, and I don't care what happened in the past, but even though they were powerful words, they need to be happening now. Amen? Amen. And so please be encouraged. Be in faith. Let's stand together.